Church online community. My name is Linda, and I'm so excited about today's online experience. As you're jumping on live, we want to hear from you. Send us a wave or drop an emoji in the comments to let us know you're here. Before we get started, we wanted to give you some tips for a better online experience. Number one, don't watch. That's right. We don't want you to watch this service. We want you to join this service. No matter who you are or where you're from, we believe God brought you here for a reason. And we want you to be a part of creating and contributing to this online experience. After all, the church is not a building, it's a people. Number two, minimize distractions. It's really easy to get distracted, whether it's someone walking outside, a notification on your phone, or one of your kids jumping on you. Do your best to minimize distractions because we believe that when we remove distractions, it allows our minds to focus on God and hear what His Spirit wants to say to our hearts. Number three, ask questions and take your next step. If you have questions at any point, feel free to raise your hand or drop it in the comments. We believe in next steps, and we know that one small step toward God can change our lives forever. Maybe you want to join a group, get involved serving, or make a decision to follow Jesus. No matter what your next step is, one of our chat hosts would love to connect with you and help you take that step. As we begin the service, focus your mind and heart on drawing near to God. Remember, it's never just another Sunday, never just another church service. We have the opportunity right now to allow the Spirit of God to speak to our hearts and change us from the inside out. Are you ready? Let's go. to hear stories of how God is using this ministry to change lives. If this church has impacted your life, then share your story. Reach out to us on our website or message us on social media and let us know what God is doing. And a huge shout out to those of you who are partnering with us through online giving and recurring giving. Giving changes lives and you are making a difference every single day. If you would like to get started with online giving, simply click the link to partner with what God is doing through this church to change the world around us.
Hey there, if you've ever been ticked off or disappointed with God, you're not alone. Many people have questioned the sovereignty of God. I mean, God has a lot of explaining to do, right? Why, if God is so good, does he allow such horrible things to happen? Especially to those who call him Savior. And we need saving. So God, where are you? So today, we are answering the question, why does God let bad things happen to good people? Why does God let bad things happen to good people? So number one, listen for yourself. Make this time personal. God knows you need it. Number two, don't listen through the lens of your past. Yesterday is history. Tomorrow, a mystery. But today is a gift. And that's why they call it the present. Number three, listen with a humble heart. We will experience the word of God today. And if we humble ourselves, we will discover God's word is good for us. So let's do that right now. Come with me as we take one step closer to Jesus. So here's what's up. We are beginning a new series entitled Hashtag No Filter. And even though I'm not going to really speak to the removing all the filters until really next week, today I'd like to speak to you um, about what I believe is a big hang up for most people. Both sinner and saint alike have asked the exact same question. Why does God let bad things happen to good people? Why does God let bad things happen to good people? And, and believe me, this does matter to how we speak to removing all the filters in our life, right? And so next week, we're going to uncover exactly how we use filters, right, uh, for the good and for the bad. Look, in light of the war in Ukraine, the recent pandemic, and the deaths that are associated with it, it's understandable that we would be asking, why God, why? Oftentimes in life, it even seems that Many people who live poorly are prospering. And we have a hard time understanding why this would happen. Because after all, we're told that if we just make good choices, you know, good things will happen. But if we're being honest, it doesn't always seem that's the way it goes, right? It doesn't always seem if we're just doing the right thing, making good choices, that good things will happen. It seems pretty tough. I mean, why would a loving God let a sexual molestation happen to an innocent 13-year-old? Why does a drunk driver live when the person in the other car dies? How can cancer and, and other disease run rampant for so long, cutting our, our, our loved one's life short, especially our children? Why does terrorism exist today? I mean, it's the 21st century. How can such a smart and technologically advanced society tolerate dictators waging war on peaceful people? Why would God allow a miscarriage while others can't seem to conceive a child? Where's my husband? Where's my wife, God? Why must I be alone? Why is hatred, bigotry, sexism, and all this chaos still thriving? Why does God let bad things happen to good people? It seems like there's a lot of bad happening. Simply put, we cause bad things to happen because we make bad decisions. And bad things happen because other people make bad decisions. And you know what? Stuff outside of our control also happens. And sometimes it's referred to as acts of God. I mean, is God behind these things? Why does God let bad things happen to good people? In this question, 
We have two subjective words, bad and good. How we look at these may determine our thought process and direct the final outcome. We live in a world of pain and suffering. There is no one who is not affected by the harsh realities of life. And the question, why do bad things happen to good people, is, well, it's one of the most difficult questions in all of theology. God is sovereign. So all that happens must at least been allowed by him, if not directly caused by him. At the outset, we must acknowledge that human beings are not eternal, infinite, or omniscient, right? Human beings cannot expect to fully understand God's promises and ways. There's a book in the Bible called Job, and the book of Job deals with the issue of why God allows bad things to happen to good people. Job was a righteous man. Scripture tells us in Job chapter 1, first verse, it says, <laughs> there was a man in the land of Uz, who, who, whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. Job's a good dude. He's living a good life, doing the right things. Job was a righteous man, yet he suffered in ways that are almost beyond belief. God allowed Satan to do everything he wanted to Job except kill him. And Satan did his worst. And what was Job's re reaction to Satan's worst? Though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. The Lord gave and the Lord taketh away. May the name of the Lord be praised. That is some solid stuff. Now, Job didn't understand why God had allowed things to happen the way that they did. But he did know that God was good. He accepted, he believed that God was good and therefore continued to trust in God. And ultimately, that should be our reaction as well. No matter what, I'll trust you, God, because you are good. So why do bad things happen to good people? Now, here's a hard truth. It's a fact. And as hard as it is to acknowledge, we must understand this. We must remember that there are no good people. In the absolute sense of the word, there are no good people. I mean, Scripture tells us um, all of us are tainted and infected with sin. Ecclesiastes uh, 7.20 says this, Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. The Bible tells us that there are no good people among us. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 1 John chapter 1 and 8 says, If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And Jesus himself said, No one is good except for God alone. No one is good except for God alone. All of us feel the effects of sin in one way or another. Sometimes it's our own personal sin that we feel. Other times it's the sin of others. We live in a fallen world and we experience the effects of that fall. One of those uh, effects is injustice. One of those effects is senseless suffering. But can God make sense of all of that? When wondering why God would allow bad things to happen to good people, it's also good to consider four things about the bad things that happen. So here's four things that we need to consider about the bad things that happen. Number one, bad things may happen to good people in this world, but listen to me, this world is not the end. Bad things may happen in this world, but this world is not the, not the end. As Christians, we have to have an eternal perspective, right? We do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and our momentary troubles are achieving for us the eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. We will have a reward someday, 
and it will be glorious. Believe it. Number two, bad things happen to good people, but God uses those bad things for an ultimate lasting good. Bad things may happen, but can't we believe that God's going to use it for a lasting good? Scripture tells us we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purposes. This is Romans chapter 8, verse 28. It's reassuring. I mean, when Joseph, uh, he, he was innocent, right, of any wrongdoing, he finally came to this her, through these horrific sufferings that had been uh, done by others, right? He, he was able to see uh, God's good plan in all of it. He was very forgiving and receiving God's goodness. And we see this in, in Genesis chapter 50, where it says, But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for I am in the place of God. I'm with God. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and for your little ones. Thus, he confronted them and spoke kindly to them. He spoke kindly to the ones who had done injustice against him. What if the kid who was sexually molested at the age of 13 didn't hold a grudge? but forgave his offenders and went on to marry and to have children and to pastor a church that was sharing the good news of Jesus Christ in his community. All around him, lives were being transformed, right? There are bad things, but God meant it for good. Bad things happen. God can turn it for good. Come on now. Number three, bad things happen to good people, but those bad things equip believers for deeper ministry. Praise be to the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. What if the drug addict that was itching to get high, surrendered to God, and instead of being a dope dealer, became a hope dealer through a residency recovery center. You see, there are bad things, but God meant it for good. God can take the bad things and turn it to good. Come on, somebody. Those with battle scars can better help those going through the battles. You see, God ministers out of our scars. One of the pastors from Crew shared this story. I, I recently read it. I thought it was uh, appropriate to share in this message. He writes, Sarah was new to church. She listened wide-eyed each Sunday, soaking up wisdom, wondering why no one had ever told her these truths before. It might have saved her from the life of abuse, right? From her unplanned pregnancies and from the many men that she had been involved with. No one told her that life could have purpose. No one told her that there was healing available to her and that there was unconditional love even in the midst of the hurt. Sarah was so grateful for that radical transformation in her life that she volunteered in all the church ministries that she could actually handle. She was all in, y'all. She was so in love with Jesus. You could see the light in her eyes and, and the passion to serve. But she mainly stayed in the background, you know, kind of like kitchen services and clean up, break, break, you know, set up, break down, that kind of stuff, just in the background. It's beautiful, because certainly there's nothing wrong with background work, you know, working in the kitchen. The church could hardly exist without those who give their time and their talent to work in the background. But, but Sarah had such a marvelous testimony that she should have been out among the hurting, telling them what God has done for her, testifying of his goodness. Now, after hearing part of her testimony and her marvel at the grace of God, her pastor told her uh, that he thought uh, God was going to have a great ministry through her story, that there was going to be a, a big impact for the kingdom of God. Now, he, he could imagine her speaking and counseling women who have experienced similar circumstances. Her response to his suggestion was, me, she said, with disbelief. I, I can't do that. I, I've done so many bad things. I'm not like uh, the other women. How could I help anyone? How could I help anyone? I've done too many bad things. I mean, I've heard this rationale from Christians so many times. 
It's one of Satan's favorite deceptions. He makes us believe that all the bad things, all, all the, the past hurts, right? That our scars from our past are just too ugly and too deformed, right? He tries his best to, to disguise, right? And we, we get shamed so that we, won't, we want to look like normal people. But I'm going to tell you something. There are no normal people. Each person has his or her struggle, right? Many are battling with the same demons that you have been through or that you are. And in God's plan, the scars we see as lesions that we should hide, right, are actually undeniable evidence of the depths and the depravity of our brokenness in this world and that God can heal us in the midst of it. It's, it's testimony of a life redeemed. Number four, bad things happen to good people and the worst things happen to the best person. Jesus was the only truly righteous one to ever live. Yet he suffered more than we can ever imagine. And we follow in his footsteps. Scripture tells us, if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he did not make threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. First Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 23. Jesus is no stranger to our pain. Romans chapter 8. Chapter 5, verse 8 declares, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Despite the sinful nature of the people of this world, God still loves us. Jesus loved us enough to die to take the penalty of our sins. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. If we receive Jesus Christ as Savior, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. John 3, 16. Will you receive Jesus Christ as Savior? Listen, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Scripture says we will be forgiven and promised an eternal home in heaven if we believe. The good and the bad are subjective to the way we view them. How we respond to the good and the bad is a direct reflection of what we believe will come of them. I believe God allows things to happen for a reason. And I believe that whatever he, he allows, he redeems. <laughs> Whether or not we understand his reasons, we must remember that God is good. He's just, he's loving, and he's merciful. Often bad things happen to us that we simply cannot understand. And so instead of doubting God's goodness, our reaction should be to trust in Him. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will make your paths straight. Instead of testing the Lord, let's trust the Lord. Instead of questioning the Lord, let's trust the Lord. Instead of doubting the Lord, let's trust in the Lord. See, we walk by faith, not by sight. So let's trust the Lord. With every head bowed, with every heart open, with every eye closed. Here we are gathered together in the fellowship of God and with one another. And as we bow our heads in humility, we are ready for what God wants to do next. Are you ready for what God wants to do next? Lord, we ask you to have your way in this moment right now. If you are listening to God today, and you know you have been questioning the goodness of God, I want to pray for you. I want to pray with you. You may have had some bad things happen, but today, 
you are asking God to turn them to good. You would say, I don't understand, God, why you allow these things to happen to me. But you would also say that you're ready to trust God to turn them to good. Use these things for the benefit of me and others to glorify your name, God. I, I, I will trust you. If that's you, if that's, I'm speaking to you right now, if that's your prayer, if you want to trust in God right now, will you just slip up, slip up your hand right now, wherever you're at, just lift your hand and speak these words. I trust you, God. Help me in my unbelief. I'm ready. I trust you, God. Tell him, I surrender all to you, God. I trust you, God, to use my hurts and my scars to glorify your name. Amen. And we're still praying. Maybe you're here today. You're, you're, you're tuned in to hear a, a glorious, simple truth. And can I just keep it real with you today? The simple, glorious truth has eluded you. And perhaps you will receive that truth today because God loves you. And you're not too far away. You're, you're not too messed up. You're not too dirty. You have not done too many bad things. And all of the good things that you're, you're working on, right, to outweigh the bad things that you've done, you're exhausted with that. I got to keep, I got to keep trying. I, I, I'll do better the next time. That, that nonsense. The truth is that it's time to stop that madness. And today, receive the hope that God is offering you through Jesus. Listen, God sent Jesus at this exact time for you. While you are still hurting, making mistakes, <laughs> all the wrong, doing all the bad things, while you're, you're still in sin, Jesus comes for you. And if you're listening and you know this is you, I'm talking to you, today is the day. It's your day. God is here for you. If you say, yes, I want Jesus, I, I know I need a Savior right now, I want you to slip up your hand and, and by doing so, what you're doing, by slipping up your hand, is you're saying yes to Jesus. Jesus, forgive me. I want you in my life. <laughs> All of us that are listening today, let's pray together. Let's receive this together. And pray from your heart to his. Say this. Say, Heavenly Father, I admit I need a Savior. I have sinned and done wrong. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin. I accept Jesus as my Savior from my sin. I believe Jesus died for me. So from this day forward, I will live for him. I declare this day, Jesus is my Lord, my Savior, and my King. Amen and amen. Man, if you have said that prayer for the very first time and you have received Jesus today, please let us know today in the comment section. Just let us know because we have a gift we want to get to you that'll help you receive grace and mercy each and every day. Your next step is to tell somebody. So let us know that Jesus is your Lord. You've made that decision today and we're going to celebrate with you. Everybody else, let's go and do the great things that God has called us to do right now.
The word communion literally means to share something. It refers to sharing a meal uh, or breaking bread together at a table. And in reference to, to, to a meal that Jesus shared with his disciples before his death, that it took place in, in what we traditionally call the upper room. And that just means that it happened upstairs in somebody's house, y'all. But the meal was called the Passover meal. They were upstairs in somebody's house having a Passover meal. The Passover meal was eaten as a symbol. It was a reminder of how the nation of Israel was once enslaved in Egypt and God rescued them. Now, he did it by instructing them to put the lamb's blood on the doorpost of their houses. And as a result death would literally pass over and spare them. So God delivered them from slavery and from death. Now, the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was handed over to be killed, they shared a Passover meal together. So he took bread and he told his disciples, as he picked the bread up, he told his disciples, he said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Thank you, Father. And then in the same way, he took the cup of wine and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And they drank. You see, in this moment, in this teaching to his disciples, he was actually comparing himself to the Passover lamb. And it was a symbol for what he was about to do on the cross for them. He, he would die in their place. His body would be broken. He was also showing them that his blood would be shed as a payment for their sins. So from now on, that meal would symbolize what Jesus was about to do for them and for the rest of the world. And just in case uh, the disciples didn't get it, just in case you and I don't get it, Jesus broke it down real simple by summarizing it into, into one phrase. As you partake, do it in remembrance of me.
So today, <laughs> that's what I'm asking each of us to do, right? Just remember Jesus and what he did for you on the cross. And I want you to reflect on how that changes your life. So first, let's remember. And when we remember, we should remember that his body was broken for us. I mean, it should have been our body being broken, but it was it's our body being broken. He was beaten. We should have been beaten. He was crucified. We're sinful, and, and our sins are cause for death, and we should be crucified for our sins. But he died to pay a penalty that we couldn't pay. And so we remember that his blood was poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. And we are forgiven, and we're made righteous in his sight. And we should reflect. In remembering, we should reflect on what that means to us, that sacrifice. The fact that Jesus loved us so much that he would willingly die for us, such a gruesome death that he didn't deserve, that we could spend eternity with God, should move us towards worship. It should move us towards action. So let's take a few minutes to, to remember and reflect in silence. Look, this time is between you and God. Maybe you'd like to spend time thanking him for who he is and for what he's done for your life. Maybe you would use this time to confess your sins or, or wrongdoings or the difficulties and ask for forgiveness. Let's pause right now and spend time with God. Let us pray. God, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for loving us so much that you would spare nothing, not even your son, to save us from our sins. Help us to always remember that love and reflect on the sacrifice on our behalf. Give us strength to live our lives by faith in him this week. In Jesus' name, you are our Lord, our Savior, and our King. Amen. For as often as you eat this bread and drink from this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Thanks again for joining us today. It is our hope that this community will be a place where we can encourage one another to be more devoted followers of Jesus Christ and to share his hope and love with the world around us. If you would like to experience the hope and love that is found in a personal relationship with Jesus, let us know by simply typing Jesus in the comments. Or maybe you're ready to be baptized, join a group, or get involved serving. No matter what your next step is, we are here to connect with you and help you pursue a deeper, more meaningful relationship with God. We pray that the Holy Spirit would make the Word of God come alive to you this week and that his presence will be with you no matter where you go. We encourage you to stay up to date with this community by visiting our website or following us on any of our social media platforms. Have a great week.